Have you been wanting to build or start your own recording studio? In this video, I'm going to take you through my setup, show you what I'm working with in 2021, and at the end, I'm going to show you some basics that you need to get started. What's up everybody, Stephen Michael Thornton here. I am a singer, songwriter, producer, and I'm gonna take you through my whole setup and show you what I use to record cover songs, to record original songs. Basically, everything uh, that I create musically is done right here in this small room. This video is gonna be a little bit different than some of the other videos that are out on YouTube by other producers and songwriters because I am literally working out of a bedroom. This isn't just a spare bedroom, that I actually sleep in this room too. So I've got my music production here and uh, you'll see how the whole setup is. But um, hopefully uh, it'll help you guys uh, get some ideas uh, if you're in a similar situation. So here we go. So this is it. So you can actually see that this is a true bedroom studio. I have my setup right there under the loft bed. I have my guitar section over here, and I'm just gonna do a little bit of a circle around the room so you can see what this is looking like. So you can see I've really done my best to make the most use of the space here, and this loft bed really, really helps. And while it can be a little bit annoying to get up and down every now and then, um, there are actually some advantages which I'll talk about in a little bit. So let's come over here and let's check out this space first. And I'm just kind of, kind of go uh, space by space here. The first thing is the Keystation 88 by M Audio. This is my go-to. I am using this all the time on pretty much everything. And the keys are semi-weighted. They're not fully weighted, but they're semi-weighted. So that helps me out a little bit, but this year I'm probably going to upgrade to uh, something that's fully weighted. I'm a guitar player, a guitar player and singer as my primary instrument. So um, yeah, learning piano uh, and getting better at it has been something that I'm starting to take more seriously. The next thing I have here is my other MIDI controller. I use this for programming drums. It's super simple. I think it's only like a hundred bucks or something like that, but it gets the job done. Next thing is my audio interface. I use the Apogee Duet. I have had this for many, many years and it's been fantastic. Here I have a, a Golden Age uh, preamp. Uh, mic pre. It's just a single line mic pre. Actually also it has a direct input. I do a lot of bass guitar through this actually. I just do direct into that. Something you might want to know is that with my mic pre, the golden age, it's wonderful. It adds a little bit of warmth to uh, my recordings, but if you have a higher end audio interface, uh, like uh, anything from Apogee or uh, Universal Audio, they have preamps in them already. So you really don't need any externals uh, you know for the track to sound great all right the next thing is my studio monitors and these monitors have been absolutely wonderful these are the krk rocket 5 uh, this is the previous generation i think it's generation 3 uh, I believe they have generation four out, which has even more capabilities, but they've been fantastic for me. Uh, they're affordable, they sound great. Lots of professional engineers uh, rely on uh, KRK speakers. And I know there's a lot of audio people out there that really don't like the Rocket series, um, but I do, I like it. I know these speakers, they've worked really well for me. And you know, I'm, pro I'm producing pretty decent mixes. I wouldn't call myself an expert at it yet, but you know, they're getting the job done. Continuing on with speakers is that I have a secondary set of speakers right here. And it's always a good idea to have more than one set of speakers if you're going to be mixing uh, because you want to be able to reference from different sources. Now these speakers right here, I don't know the brand there, you can look that up, uh, Creative. Um, I got them off of Amazon and they're only about, I think maybe 20 or $30. They're very inexpensive, but I wanted to get an idea of what my recordings would sound like just on a regular uh, computer monitors, so that's why I got those. 
So I want to add here that referencing from multiple speakers is really, really important and it really helps uh, make your mix sound great and it helps you to be able to avoid having to go out to your car and check the mix a bunch of times. Okay, continuing on with monitors, this controls my monitors, or it at least controls the KRK Rockets. This is really meant to control more than one set of monitors, but it doesn't connect to, you know, regular uh, computer speakers. But what this does do for me right now is that it allows me to listen to mono um, in a professional format. I find it to be a lot more reliable um, than just putting a stereo width down to zero. Then when I do get probably mix cubes or something like that, I can have a second monitor selection and switch back and forth between those two. But this thing has been great so far. All right, finally, to finish up this section on monitoring, I use these Audio-Technica M50X. These headphones are amazing. They're about $150. And I tell you what, when it comes to headphones, you really can't cheap out on them. I would say nothing less than $100. Um, but these are, are, are really, really good, really reliable. I've had them for years. I use them for uh, when I'm tracking instruments and I also use them as a secondary reference. So between all of the speaker setup that I have here, I have my Rockets, that's one. I have the regular computer speakers, that's two. I have these, that's three. Um, if I wanted to plug in a set of like uh, earbuds um, for an iPhone or an Android, I could do that right here. Um, so I've got multiple reference sources. If you can get your mix sounding pretty good on all of these sources, then it'll probably translate pretty well. All right, what else do we have here? Over here, I have tucked away um, another MIDI keyboard. This, I believe, is an M-Audio uh, M49. They make this in black now. I've had this one for a very long time, but it's fantastic. These are not weighted keys at all. Um, they're just like, you know, just, just like playing a regular synthesizer. And this is great. I think it goes for like $100, and if you're looking for something really basic um, and inexpensive to get started, Go with that, uh, M-Audio Keystation 49. Okay, I'm moving over to my guitar section over here. This is uh, where I like to practice guitar. It's kind of my little area that I have set up here. So let's take a look. This is a Blues Junior amp right here. And this is my pedal board setup, which I was using a lot when I was playing live, but I am not uh, clearly using any more, at least in live situations because of all of the COVID stuff, but I'm using it for recordings and practice. So I have it still set up there. That pillow is there, not for any acoustic reasons, but because uh, I fear my cats um, falling in the jump. It's only happened one time um, and it's never happened uh, again, but you never know. Some, sometimes even cats make mistakes. And yes, this is a pathway for my cats to either chill here or get up to the bed if they want to. And these are my guitars. I'm not going to pull them out of the cases right now. You've probably seen them in other videos, uh, or maybe I'll go through them in another, another video. But um, I have a Gibson Les Paul. Uh, 2005 I think. I've got a uh, Fender Strat and then I have a Siegel acoustic guitar. And then all the way back here, because I usually only use it for recordings, are um, I have a bass guitar. I don't know why I feel like I need to show you the case, but anyway, the bass guitar is back there. Okay, so the one that I will take out of the case is this beautiful ukulele uh, that my fiance bought me for my birthday a few months ago. And uh, so far, so good. I haven't had a chance to use it in a recording yet, but hopefully I will be able to use it to write a song and put on a recording sometime soon. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is acoustic treatment. Now, I think that acoustic treatment is really, really important for any room, especially in a bedroom studio, uh, but it doesn't have to be crazy complicated. But there are a few things that I think you should consider when you're setting up a studio and trying to uh, make it sound the best that you can. The first place that I like to put acoustic treatment is directly behind the speakers. Whenever you're putting acoustic treatment in place, you want to think about first reflection points. And directly behind the speakers, especially since these speakers are close to the wall, 
I want some treatment there so it can reduce the amount of reflection coming off that wall. The second thing is I have acoustic treatment behind my computer monitor because that's gonna cover that middle point of the wall. Next thing you'll see is I have some treatment over here in the corner. Now this is not ideal. This is not an ideal setup right here, but I'm working with what I have. What I've done uh, to kind of compensate is I have a first reflection point right here and I've covered up this little bit of wall um, right over here. And I've also put all of my guitar cases and any other cases in this corner because I want to kind of build up as much like insulation in that corner as possible so that there's not a lot of sound reflection or bass buildup or anything like that. What would be ideal is to have bass traps in that corner, but because of the setup, it's just really not ideal to have a, a, a bass trap in there. So this is what I'm doing, and I do notice the difference if I take the guitar cases out. Um, I'm getting more reflection. If I put them in, it really, really deadens the sound in that area. So that's something you might want to consider for yourself as well. Let's take a look at the other side of the room. Now, it looks like this side of the room doesn't have much of anything going on, but it actually does, and I will show you. This room divider right here, I have actually turned into treatment. And the whole thing, except for the very bottom, the whole thing is uh, treated. It's kind of like this whole wall has treatment on it and it really, really makes a difference. Now I don't record in this side of the room. This side of the room has a little more reflections in it. Um, I usually tend to record over in this area or um, you know, right around here because there's more things that are absorbing sound in this area. So remember earlier in the video when I said that there were some advantages to having a loft bed and having your studio set up under a loft bed? I'm gonna talk about that now. Okay, so I never thought about this before and I certainly didn't plan it, but being under a loft bed actually kind of acts like a cloud in your listening position. I mean, things under here are so dead. In a previous apartment that I had, I was doing um, acoustic treatment on the ceiling uh, over my listening position. But this, I haven't had to do that because I'm underneath this and it, and it really has reduced reflections a lot. All right, so this is my listening position. And right behind me, I have put up treatment on this part of the closet door. I'm gonna do a separate video where I show how I do this without ruining walls. Um, there's a very simple and easy way to do it and I'm gonna show you how, so, you know, like, subscribe, come back to this channel if you wanna know. This treatment is really, really helpful. You want to have treatment um, behind you so that you're not getting reflections off of that wall and messing with the way you hear things. Now, here's something interesting that you'll notice and I apologize in advance for that bright light, but, I have my closet door open, and I have my closet door open for a reason. I don't want this to be closed when I'm recording or when I'm uh, mixing music. Why? Because it leaves a whole area open where sound can be reflected back. What you want is you want things to absorb sound. It doesn't matter if it's a closet full of clothes or if it's this stuff, or a mattress, or whatever. It doesn't matter. You may have heard about people uh, recording vocals in a closet before, and the reason is because, I'm gonna stick my head in here. It is so quiet in here. It's so quiet in here. Sometimes I uh, bring my guitar amp in here and close the closet door and mic it up just to make a little cabinet in here because it's so so quiet so my point is you really don't want to have bare walls you know reflecting things back to you you want to try to cover things up or have things in the way that make the room not symmetrical in order to break up the sound because everything in your room is going to reflect the sound that comes out of your speakers. One more part of my room that I completely forgot to talk about is this. The curtains. The curtains are really important. I have a window here, and if you have a window, 
you really want to cover it up. And ideally, you would get blackout curtains or thick curtains. You don't want to get anything flimsy or something that you can see through. You want something that's going to be thick so that it can uh, cover up this window and uh, just reduce any reflections that could come off the glass. All right, the next thing I want to talk about are the microphones I use. And microphones are so important because they're the thing that actually capture the audio. So it's good to uh, consider different microphones and listen to uh, the different sounds and the di different textures that they have and really be experimental with them. My go-to microphone for vocals is the Shure SM7B. And this microphone, I'm sure you've heard about it because everybody likes to use it, but there's a reason that everybody likes to use it and it's because it's a really great microphone. Honestly, if you only bought one microphone, this would be the one, for recording at least. The next mic I use a lot is the Shure SM57. This is a tried and true microphone. You've probably seen everybody use it. If you play uh, live with a band or your guitar player or whatever, you've probably seen the uh, uh, house engineer mic your amp up with this microphone because it's great. It doesn't just work live, it also works in the studio. I love to use it for micing guitar amps. Um, I have used it for acoustic guitar before. I have used it for vocals too. It can actually work uh, really well as a vocal mic in some situations. Um, again, it's great to experiment song by song. So Shure uh, SM57. Next mic is the Shure Beta 58A. Now this is like uh, the SM58, except the EQ is uh, a little bit different. There's a little bit more higher end in this. So um, I find that it gives you a little more cut, particularly in a live setting. Now I use this for live vocals, but I thought I'd talk about it here because it really is one of my favorite microphones. I bring this to every gig that I play and um, I, I don't sing on other people's microphones. Um, and especially now in COVID, I've that after all of this is over, everybody's gonna be singing on their own mics. But anyway, fantastic mic, and just because a mic is mostly used live doesn't mean you can't try it out in the studio. I mean, I don't think I've used this on a recording before, but I might try. Uh, you know, it could, uh, it might help me get some interesting sounds. All right, the next microphones, I just recently got these and I'm gonna do a video on these microphones because I really, really like them, um, are the Presonus PM2. Now these are a set of pencil microphones and these are meant to be used as a pair. They're just fantastic and they're pretty affordable. I also have this microphone, uh, the Yeti Blue microphone and uh, before I had my whole setup and I just had something very basic, I started with this mic. And it works great if you just want to record demos or something like that. I don't think that this records at a professional quality um, for recordings. I mean, this is a USB connection and uh, I don't think that USB connections um, record high enough audio quality. Uh, to make a professional recording. But um, it works great for demos, it works great for podcasting, it works great for um, live streaming. It's, it has worked very well for me over the years and I still pull it out every now and then. So those are my microphones and this year I'm probably going to add a large diaphragm condenser microphone to my collection. Large diaphragm condenser microphones are typically the microphone that most people go to for recording vocals and guitar. But I go with this microphone, which is a dynamic microphone, um, the Shure SM7B, because it fits my voice better. I, I have a higher voice and I have a lot of high frequencies in my voice and this microphone really balances out my voice a lot um, with some lower end. But I do want to get a large diaphragm condenser microphone because I have some ballads that I want to record and condenser microphones are very sensitive and they pick up all of the details. Since these are going to be softer songs, I just want to have that option of uh, having that large diaphragm condenser uh, to make some different kinds of sounds. So that's probably coming up this year for me. 
So this is it. This is my studio setup. This is what I'm working with in 2021. I'm recording all of my songs here, doing all of my production, mixing, mastering, everything right here in this room. And in a minute, I'm gonna go into uh, what you need if you're trying to get started, the bare minimum that you need to get started. But first, I wanna tell you about a project that I'm working on. I am recording uh, my first EP entirely on my own and that is gonna be released in a few months. I already have a few songs recorded and I'm finishing up the production process right now and I'm really, really, really excited to share it with you because in the past, I have uh, written lots of songs, I've recorded lots of songs, um, but I've, I've always either recorded somewhere else or I've done a lot of recording here, but then sent the songs out to be mixed somewhere else or mastered somewhere else. So this new EP that I'm creating is going to be the first collection of songs that I have completely uh, produced and created in-house. I've written everything, I've recorded everything, tracked everything right here. Um, I'll be mixing everything right here and mastering everything right here. So it's all in-house. It's kind of scary, kind of scary to think about it. Um, I, I hope that people will like it. I'm really just doing the best I can to, to create the best music that I can. Um, but you know, I'm an independent artist and, and you know, we don't always have uh, tons of money to throw around all over the place. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm just doing the best I can with what I have and I hope you really like it. If that sounds like uh, something you might want to follow or uh, be interested in, click like, subscribe, all of that, um, and follow me on Instagram because I would really, really love to share this journey with you. Okay, now moving on to what you need if you want to do a setup like this. Now, I have acquired all of this gear over the course of several years. And I'll be the first person to tell you that you don't need all of this stuff in order to create great music. Now, if I didn't upgrade anything, I don't need to upgrade anything. I want to upgrade stuff, I'm going to upgrade stuff, but I don't need to upgrade anything to make music and make music that is of, you know, a, a really good quality. Um, but what do you need? What you need, in my view, is you need a computer that can be able to handle the uh, uh, capabilities or has the capabilities rather of um, recording music. You need an audio interface, you need a microphone, and you need some type of MIDI controller. So for your computer, what kind of capabilities do you need? You need something that has as fast of a CPU as you can possibly get. Now it doesn't have to be crazy, but if you buy something new, it's likely going to have a fast enough CPU. The real thing you want to look out for is RAM. RAM is your random access memory, and I'm not an expert on computers, but my understanding is that um, your RAM is used for the processing that is happening in real time. So when you have a digital audio workstation up, a DAW, you're going to have various tracks up and different virtual instruments and all of that um, takes CPU and it takes RAM. And so those things you really need to make sure you have. So how much RAM? A minimum of eight gigabytes and probably more. Eight gigabytes can probably get you by um, if you're doing uh, projects that don't require more than, I don't know, maybe like 30 tracks or something like that. I'm just pulling that out of thin air. I don't know what the actual number is. But my point is, is that the project can't be too big if you're gonna work off of eight gigabytes. Um, 16 gigabytes is great. If you have 16 gigabytes of RAM, you're gonna be able to do uh, a lot of production. The more RAM you have, really, the better. If you wanna do really, really big projects um, with you know over 100 tracks or something like that, you probably you know wanna maybe get like 32 gigs. The more gigabytes of RAM, the better. There's, it's impossible to have too much RAM, so go for as much as, as you can afford. Now, I mentioned the DAW, a digital audio workstation. Uh, when I was talking about the computer setup, and that really should be the fifth thing that you need. 
um, you do need some sort of software to be able to record. Um, I use Pro Tools and I use Logic. I like to arrange uh, sounds and do virtual instruments and whatnot in Logic because there's lots of variety and I find that a little bit easier to navigate than Pro Tools. But I like to do all of my audio production in Pro Tools because I just love the workflow of Pro Tools. I like to mix in Pro Tools um, and master in Pro Tools. So those are my two. But some other ones are Studio One. There is uh, Cubase, um, Ableton, there's a bunch of others that I'm not remembering right now, but uh, choose any one of them and they'll get the job done for you. Next thing is audio interface. Now the audio interface is the way that sound gets into your computer and the way sound comes out of your computer into your speakers. You can get audio interfaces for as cheap as maybe $100. I think Focusrite uh, makes a lot of really affordable audio interfaces. And if that's where you are in your budget, just go for it and get it because they make some really good quality now. Um, but you just need something where you can plug in a guitar and play, or you can plug in a microphone and be able to sing or mic an amp or mic an acoustic. And that's really all you need. Now, the higher you go um, in price point, usually the more quality you're going to get. I like the Apogee Duet. Um, I also like Universal Audio. Uh, they're great. All of them are great. But just get what you can afford and get started. Microphones. We went through microphones earlier, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But really, you just need one type of microphone. And if you're going to choose one, I would say either the Shure SM7B or some type of large diaphragm condenser microphone. And if you're not sure about the differences between those two, just search large diaphragm condenser or dynamic microphone or Shure SM7B online or on YouTube. There's a bunch of videos about it. And these types of microphones work great for guitar, for vocals, for just about anything. So if you choose one, choose one of those two and you'll be good to go. Once you have all of that, you will need some type of way to get MIDI into your computer and that's done with a MIDI controller. You can do it with something like this, although you don't necessarily need 88 keys. You can do it with a, a, a smaller version. Um, I believe uh, I saw recently uh, this brand, this same brand, Akai, I hope I'm saying that right, um, Akai, I saw something of this where it was a very small MIDI controller with keys, like a keyboard that was only, I think, less than $100. And this was only $100 too. I use this for beats. I don't really have to do that. I could do it from my keyboard if I wanted to, or just one small keyboard. Um, this is a luxury. This is just so that I can play beats a little bit faster. But just get some type of MIDI controller because in your digital audio workstation, your DAW, um, you're going to have virtual instruments and you can play piano or keys or drums or strings and all of that and you need MIDI to do that. Most uh, computers now and most MIDI keyboards allow for uh, direct USB input. Um, and they're not powered. You don't have to have um, a power adapter or plug it into a wall or anything like that. It's usually just powered by the computer with a USB cable, so that makes it nice and easy. The last thing that I will add, and I guess this makes it six things now, it's not really necessary, but it's ideal if you have some type of monitors to listen on. You can do headphones too, but be very, very, very careful with headphones. If you listen for too long or too loud on headphones, you can really cause ear damage. So you wanna be careful about that. I use my headphones just to reference and just to, uh, I use it for tracking when I'm doing vocals or guitar or something like that. Um, and then when I'm mixing, I use it to reference, but I don't mix on headphones. That's another topic for another video. But um, I believe that Presonus has uh, some small studio monitors that are about $100 and they're great. They're small, so you're not going to hear like a lot of low bass frequency, but they can definitely get you started and moving in the right direction. All right, so if you have all of that stuff, you're good to go. You're good to uh, start working and making music, writing. And the great thing about production nowadays is that you don't have to be an expert at it. And really with the basic setup that I gave you, it's not the ideal setup to be able to mix in. You need a little bit more to be able to mix and master music, but you can write music, you can come up with ideas, you can record, um, you can make uh, a, a fully produced 
um, song with all of your sounds and, and audio and all that stuff, you can make that um, within the Digital Audio Workstation and then you can have somebody else mix it. You can have somebody else mix and master it so you don't have to know everything. You can do all of it with a basic setup and I did that for years and, and it worked great. I'm only just now getting to the point where I feel confident enough uh, to be able to uh, mix and master on my own. This is a process and don't get caught up in thinking that you need to have the perfect equipment or the perfect computer or the perfect microphone or you know whatever. I have resigned myself to the fact that there's always going to be another piece of gear that I want. That's just the way it is. I'm always going to want another toy to play with. But like I said, I've got what I need. I've got what I need. And I really don't need anything else. I just get extra things because they're fun and because it helps me be creative. And, and maybe it helps me uh, produce better music. Who knows? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe just the inspiration of having something new helps me create uh, new and more creative sounds. I don't know, but it's just something fun for me. And I hope that you have fun with it as well because this should all be fun. You shouldn't take it too seriously. All right, that's my video. I hope that this was helpful uh, to you. If it was, uh, give me a thumbs up, like, comment, subscribe, leave me a comment, tell me what you liked, tell me what you didn't like, tell me what I could do better because I'm new at this and you know I'm just trying to do the best I can here so I'm open to your your tips and your guidance and whatnot but anyway thanks for checking out this video and stay in touch uh, if you want to hear more uh, of my EP that I was talking about earlier or um, if you want to see more videos because I'm going to try to do more videos like this. Alright, I'm rambling enough now. Bye. See you in the next one.